Okay, again, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for being here. And also thank you to uh, the visitors who have, who have come and um, desire also to be a blessing and to, and to be a witness to the baptisms that are going to be um, held this afternoon. And, um, and I pray that it would be a blessing to you. And I, and I pray that you'd be encouraged through the message also uh, today, uh, no doubt challenged, but as well encouraged in the wonderful hope that we find within the Scriptures. There's going to be a number of people that are going to be baptised today. They're being baptised because they've come to believe something that has changed their lives. Now, it, hasn't, it hasn't really just changed their lives. It's actually changed their forever. It's, it's changed their eternity. It's, it's changed everything. It's changed. There's nothing that stays the same their entire scope, their entire worldview, everything has been changed, everything has been impacted. Their fear has been given way to love and their anxieties have been given way to hope. They have a peace now that could never be taken away from them. They're now being given a spirit of love and of sound mind, no longer a spirit of fear. Everything's changed, everything's changed. Oh, my, my goodness, everything's changed, you know. Um, you never go back. Though there's going to be times that you're going to want to, but you will never go back. You will always have a continual ongoing hope and, and not a hope-so hope. The world doesn't understand hope. The world thinks hope is a hope-so hope. Yeah, I hope this happens and I hope this happens. No, that's not the hope of the Bible. The hope of the Bible is an absolute assurance of hope that we are yet to realise it's something that is promised that is a definite certainty but has yet to be seen. It's not a hope that is seen. A hope that is seen is not hope. A hope that is seen is not hope. But it's, it's not only life that has changed. It's not only life that will never be the same. Death has lost its sting. The entire concept of death has changed. Our fear of death is no longer there. Matter of fact, death is actually swallowed up in victory, the Bible says. So death has changed as well. It's not just life that's changed, it's death that's changed. Everything's changed. I don't know, I reckon that's a good thing. You know, I think that's good news. There's a wonderful blessing that there is no fear of death anymore. And... For those who are not yet saved, there ought to be a fear of death. But for those who are saved, who are born again, who know the Lord Jesus Christ, who have believed the gospel to the changing of their own souls, um, there is no more fear of death. Matter of fact, there's, an, there's almost like a, 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 a joyful expectation of it, though probably not anything that leads to it, but at the same time, there's a joyful knowledge that when we open our eyes, we're going to be with the Lord. There was a gentleman who I knew from a previous church who was an elderly, elderly man. He was undergoing a triple bypass surgery and those were in the days where those surgeries were relatively new and the nurse was trying to give him comfort and stuff like that just before he went under in, in the anaesthetic and, and he, said, um, he said to her, that's okay, it's okay. I know the Lord, I know Jesus. Either my eyes are going to open, I'm going to see the eyes of my, and the face of my beautiful wife, or my eyes are going to open, I'm going to see the face of my Saviour. So either way, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed, I have hope. So he had no fear, no fear. Now all this happened also, we see that the eunuch in the text that we've just been looking at there in Acts chapter 8, um, just like this eunuch of great authority, this is a great a man who was known as, basically he was the treasurer of the entire estate, the entire kingdom of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. Those who were baptised today also had something else that occurred to them at one point in their lives that this eunuch had and that was they had someone who preached unto them Jesus. Someone who preached unto them Jesus. Someone who told them about Christ. There's at some point in their lives they heard of this man, they heard of Jesus Christ and they heard about what he had done and, and why he came and why he died and how he rose from the dead. They heard about Christ. And 
You know, it's been long regarded as the greatest story that's ever told. What Jesus did is the greatest story that has ever been told. And it's been regarded as that. It changed the entire world. It, it changed the course of history. Everything about the Lord Jesus Christ and what He has done is irrefutable. In fact, history itself has a dating system that hinges upon the birth of Christ. It's either before Christ or it's after His death or the Anno, Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. The entire dating system has changed and it's all done in the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it's incredible. I mean, just think about it just for a second. Your own birthday is identified in the light of His. Your own birthday is identified in the light of His. Writing about Christianity is the single most incredible impact on the Western world. This agnostic writer, who was not a Christian, his name is Tom Holland, he's got a recent book out that I've been reading and I, and I love it. it. The title of it is Dominion, How the Christian Revolution Remade the World. He writes this, Quote, even in the 21st century, as the tide of Western dominance, dominance palpably retreats, assumptions bred of Europe's ancestral faith continue to structure the way that the world organises itself. Whether in North Korea or in the command structures of jihadi terrorist cells, there are few so ideologically opposed to the West that they are not sometimes obliged to employ the international dating system. Whether they do so, whenever they do so, they are subliminally reminded of the claims made by Christianity about the birth of Jesus. Time itself has been Christianized. I love that. He's coming from an agnostic who recognizes what Jesus did that Jesus' death, His burial, His resurrection, and that the reality of that has actually transformed the entire world, acknowledged by an agnostic writer, a historian, one who can see the history of the world and recognises that whether you believe in the Gospel or you don't believe in the Gospel, that you believe in Christ or you don't believe in Christ, every impact of your day is testament to the reality of Christ. You, you can't even give a date without acknowledging Jesus. Yet, the entire world, the entire world has turned its back on this man. The entire world has, has decided that they no longer want to believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and now is reaping the consequences of that. The truth is no longer preached very rarely preached, it's certainly not preached with a tremendous amount of clarity and the world itself has turned its back on the truth and now it's not, lot, not that they don't believe the truth anymore, it's that now they believe anything, anything, anything that people want to believe is apparently true. All this, all this with regards to Christ was preached because somebody preached unto the people Jesus. This is a man who died the common death of a criminal 2,000 years ago. And he did this in, the, in some backwater province of the Roman Empire in part of what's known as the Fertile Crescent of the, of, uh, of the Middle East. It's just, it just seems so obscure that this man changed the world and yet he didn't seem to be very significant necessarily in the eyes of the world at the time. There was everything, everything changed and the people changed. Everything changed. Then these who are baptised today they've changed. They've ch there was a, there were years ago, there was a, um, my family used to enjoy watching a, uh, there was a particular movie that came out, I can't remember the year that it came out, but I don't know how many times we've seen the movie, but we used to love sitting around and watching A Knight's Tale, A Knight's Tale. And, um, and it was just such a pleasant movie to see and it was with, uh, with the actor Heath Ledger. And there was a phrase in the movie that became the underlying theme of the entire film and it began by the hope of the father when his son was a child and that his father had simply hoped that his son might change his star, change his star. And when you look at what's happened to these individuals who have believed the Lord Jesus Christ, they have certainly changed their star. Matter of fact, the Bible actually says that they will light up 
the heavens themselves as the stars in the firmament light up the heavens. It's incredible consideration when you think about it. There is simply no greater change of stars than when a man or a woman or a child believes the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and they are born again. This is a real change there when the heart believes the gospel. There's a, there's a real change there. Now, as few words as I could possibly do justice this morning, I want to preach unto you Jesus. And I want to actually preach from the very same text that this Ethiopian eunuch, this great man under Candace, um, the queen of the Ethiopians, I want to preach to you from the very text that he was reading. From the very text that he was reading. So I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah and chapter 53. We're only going to be honing in on three verses there. Verses 6 to 9. Isaiah chapter 53. So in the middle of your Bibles, turn right. You'll go past the wisdom books, past the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. You'll go past those ones. First one you'll find is the book of Isaiah. It's a large book. 66 chapters there. Chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, and we're going to read from verse 6 to 9. I love this book. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, Yet he opened not his mouth, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generations? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for this time, the blessing that you are to us. And that these short points, dear Father, that I make, I pray, dear Father, would give us an understanding of who Christ is. That when I preach unto this people, Jesus, that they may believe and that they may in every way rejoice in the new birth. I ask and pray, dear Lord, please be with us, dear Father, in every way. Amen. First is that Jesus bore our sins. Have a look there in verse 6. It says there, we all like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. The book of Isaiah was some 700 years before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet here is an incredible testimony that it preaches with regards to the reality of Christ. It speaks about this faith and this great man of Ethiopia happened to be reading his very own copy of the book of Isaiah. And that's not a small thing. It would have, he would have had to pre-order that book. That, all, that book then would have been handwritten as manuscripts were in those days. There were no printing presses. This would have taken several months to undertake. And it wasn't just handwritten by anybody. The individual had to be of the tribe of Levi. You could not be preaching the God or be writing the testimonies of the, word in the, of the Word of God in the Bible unless you were a Levitical part of the Levitical priesthood. It wasn't given to anybody to do. So only the Levites had the blessing of the Lord to be able to provide this. It would have come at great expense. And here he is in his chariot reading, reading this book, this scroll. It wasn't a book like this, it would have been a scroll. And as he's reading it and he's reading through it and he's turning that scroll and he's reading this incredible book of Isaiah. It wasn't like this, it was like this. If you've ever been to, well, if you ever go to Jerusalem, you'll go to a place called the Shrine of the Book and they have the copy of the book of Isaiah wrapped around a cylindrical, um, uh, in case behind glass, wrapped behind this cylinder and it was the book of Isaiah that was actually found as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's one of the only complete books that were found as part of the Dead Sea Scrolls and there is no change. A couple of letters here and there, but other than that, it is exactly the same as the Hebrew manuscripts that the Hebrews read today and read today. It's incredible. And this is now, what, 2,000, 
200 odd years ago that that was was penned and now they still have it so he's reading the book of Isaiah not a small book 66 chapters same amount of chapters as there are books in our bible is in the book of Isaiah it's an incredible prize and what a prize it would have been to be looking at this at this at this document but while the official was evidently a great man and while he had great authority and was evidently of great wealth it would still take the guidance of a relatively insignificant man a man who certainly did not have great wealth who would have been on foot running up to this chariot and asking him the question understandest thou what thou readest how could i let some man guide me an incredible story the eunuch was there perplexed at the passage that was before him yet he was humble enough to accept an opportunity to have it explained to him by philip the evangelist don't don't get confused philip the evangelist is not philip the apostle two different philips there two different ones there's several things that i need to take for granted that we all understand something that he would have understood as well this this great eunuch this great man he would have understood the same thing that we all know today and we should automatically take for granted number one is that we all die we all die that is something that doesn't need any explanation the other thing is that death is always imminent death is always imminent though we make plans for tomorrow there is no guarantee that tomorrow will come for any one of us death is always imminent the eunuch would have understood this at the same time the third is that all of us have iniquity we are all sinners there's not one that is good no not one we all fall short of the glory of god we are all sinners we are all have iniquity this fourth one is something that should naturally come knowing that third one and that is that we will all give an account that there is a judgment i mean i don't think there's anybody in this room that actually thinks that they're perfect is there anybody you want to put your no don't put your hand no. if you think that you're perfect keep just, just a little bit of humility there just keep it down i don't think there's any of us that actually believe that we're perfect knowing that we're not perfect knowing that we have sinned knowing that we are ourselves indeed sinners just that alone gives us a recognition that you cannot be a sinner and not be held to account in other words if you are a sinner and you know have you've done wrong somebody has to hold us accountable to the wrong that's been done and if there is no accountability then well none of us have ever done wrong what is wrong what is right what is good what is evil we've got no idea there's no standard now this is the reality we all die death is always imminent all have sinned and therefore should expect a judgment in verse 6 it says we all like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all all notice that it's not some of our iniquity no, notice that it's not some of our sins notice notice that it's not the, just these little ones over here but it's also all of them there's no limitation to the iniquity that god has not laid upon the savior the passage doesn't give a single hint of any limitation to our to our sins and we can't say that it only refers to the sins that we've done in the past because all our sins were yet future to his death all of our sins were yet future to his death so saying that it's the sins that we've done in the past is irrelevant because they're all future to christ it's all of our iniquity everything that we've done all that we have thought all that is in the past all that is yet potentially in the future the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all that's an incredible consideration just just think about that for a second how many times have you wanted to start life again with a clean slate how many times have you wanted just everything to just everything that you've done in the past all the the misery that you've caused the stupid things that you've come out of your mouth and maybe that's just me most likely but you know all of, how much do you want that just to be forgotten imagine having all of that cast as far away as the east is from the west oh 
to start everything afresh. People have literally left their homes, packed their bags, gone into a foreign country or even into just another city that their sins would not be remembered or even known by the people that they came to visit or they came to spend their lives with. Because living in a small town, everybody knows everybody's sins, you see. And we want to escape our past. How many of us have thought that at times past? Well, this is exactly what the Lord has laid on Christ. This is exactly. It's not also a limitation of who. You'll notice that the text says that the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. There's no limitation to who. Um, the passage might have originally been written to the Jews and for the Jews and yet we recognise the Jews rejecting their Messiah. It's opened up the hope of salvation to the entire world. Paul writes in Romans 11 saying, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Speaking of Israel, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. That's, that's you and I. Unless you're a Jew, it's you and I. There are only two people groups in the world, Jews and Gentiles, that's it. Romans 5.18, referring first to Adam who had, who had committed the first offence, we get the impression that this was always going to be the case. Paul writes, therefore, as by the offence of one, that's Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, that's Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. All men, all. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There is no limitation as to whom this text in Isaiah applies. No, 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 sorry. Sorry, there is. No, I'm sorry, there is. It only applies to sinners. So if you're not a sinner, Jesus didn't die for you. All right, so if you've never committed any sin, Jesus didn't die for you. It only applies to sinners. If you're a sinner, you qualify. You qualify. Completely qualify. That's what this text refers to. It refers to you as a sinner, if indeed you are a sinner. It doesn't matter the colour of your skin. It doesn't matter the gender. It doesn't matter your occupation. It doesn't matter what you have done in your past. It doesn't matter what you do in the future. Jesus Christ, the Lord, has died for your sins. There's no limitation here other than the fact that you're a sinner. That's it. The second point this morning, Jesus silently took our judgment. Verse 7 of the text says, He was oppressed and He was afflicted, yet He opened not His mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so He openeth not His mouth. It's a curiosity here. An interesting consideration with regards to this judgment. He is standing there as being judged and being judged by essentially his peers and he doesn't open his mouth, he doesn't speak. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Ecclesiastes 12, as Solomon completes his incredible writing in the book of Ecclesiastes, in searching for the purpose and the meaning of life in that book, he closes with this. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. This is the part that we generally don't like to hear about. It's nice to hear that we're going to have all our sins forgiven. It's nice to hear that we're going to have everlasting life, that we have a, a hope of, of heaven. But this is the natural aspect of our lives that comes with death. The natural accounting, the, 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 the reckoning day, the reckoning day, the time in history that we have to give an account to our Maker. And this is not a small thing. This creates fear in people. This is why people have a fear of death. What's next? What's next? It's this fear of the unknown. What's next? And there's so much fear that creates within man with regards to this that they've created so many different schemes in the hope that somehow man is going to escape it. They even, some even become atheists in order to fool themselves into thinking that 
in denying the reality of God, they can then thereby deny any risk of accountability to God. So they become atheists. I mean, that has to be the motivation. That has to be the motivation. I mean, nobody can come up with an idea in their minds, draw some little interesting pictures in and uh, sketches in a book and say, that's true. These little pictures, you know, the monkey that goes to the man, I believe that that's true. Because in history, that's the only place that it's ever found. It's only ever found in an illustration in a book. It's never found in reality. They do this, they do this, and this is part of their... They enter into a period of wishful thinking and they, they do, they create these imaginary creatures um, that have only ever appeared as animated in a, in, a, in a book that they drew themselves. And they call these things theories. They call these things theories in the hope that it might gain some level of respectability. Well, the Bible speaks about them. It says that they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1, 21 to 22. Beloved, the fear of death has motivated men and women to deny that life has any consequence to contend with. Hearts are so far removed from God that there is no longer a fear of God even before their eyes. Every single one of us began as we go through life, even as a child, there is this question about death. We have an interesting concept of it because at some point in our lives, we hear about somebody dying and a child will often ask the question with regards to death. And I remembered as a child that I would ask my mum the same question with regards to death and my only hope that I have was that I could still dream. I loved dreaming as a child. That was, that was one of my favourite pastimes. The only reason I really wanted to go to sleep is so I could dream. So I could be someone different in my dreams than I am in life. You know, I was always the hero in my dreams. So I, you know, I used to watch, you know, the old cowboy movies and stuff like that. I was always swinging in on something and rescuing the handmaiden. And I was just in primary school. It was such a cool thing. Then reality. Woke up, I woke up. I didn't want to go wake up. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three. What happens? There is no fear of God before our eyes, there's a real concern. When I speak to people and I ask them if they fear death at all, and they say, no, they have no fear of death, either they're lying or they have already gone beyond feeling. They have left themselves in a state of self-confidence and self-delusion that they have no right to. If there's anything that they should fear, it's death. Why? The Bible says that death is an enemy. And it actually says it's going to be the last enemy that will be destroyed, will be death. Romans 3, verse 10. It says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit, the poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The way of peace they have not known. Those being baptised today have found the way of peace. There is only one. But those who reject God can never have peace. They can never have peace. You know the famous saying, you know, when you're really, really busy and you say, oh, mate, you know, uh, you know there's no rest. And they go, yeah, yeah, there's no, there's no rest to the wicked. That's actually found in the book of Isaiah. And the word is peace, not rest, it's peace. There is no peace unto the wicked. There can never be peace unto the wicked because when the wicked rest, they will never rest in peace but in torment ongoing, perpetual, for all eternity. This is the state of what we refer to as the nature of hell. This is what the Bible refers to as hell. It's not a pleasant topic. It's not a pleasant topic to, call, to go into. And yet, this is the reality. Yet they go on and they go on believing and deluding themselves that they have peace. They do what the Israelites did in the book of Jeremiah. The prophets come to them and they actually preach to them, peace, peace, when there is no peace. 
And this is the state of every heart that rejects God. If you are one of these who have no fear of God, please consider that the denial that there is no judgment condemns your own hypocrisy. Why does it condemn our own hypocrisy? Well, because we are first happy to judge. We are happy to judge others. Turn back in that chapter of Romans, turn to chapter 2 and have a look at verse 3. Paul writes this in verses 3 to 6, he says in Romans chapter 2, verse 3, he says, As then thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. And this is the reality. This is the reality. That's the wake up. And Paul is desiring that, you, that we may wake up. Those who would read this would wake up, that they would realise that they are not going to be able to escape it. And the very fact that they deny judgment also do not, betrays their own hypocrisy because they are first happy to judge others' sins against them. And yet they more most often do the same things. There is a good reason why Jesus stood silent before his accusers a good reason why he stood silent because he was standing in our place he was standing in our place what can you say what are you going to be able to say if you stood before a righteous judge how are you going to be able to defend your own actions where the very truth is standing right before you where the judgment of all good and evil perfectly is standing before you when the one who knows the thoughts and intents of our own hearts is the one that is the one that is standing there judging us, are we going to be able to open our mouths? Those who are born again, those for whom Christ stood in our stead, when he opened not his mouth, we have the right only to rejoice. Only to rejoice. But if there is an unwillingness and, and a desire to reject that offering that Christ has offered, you will also stand silent. It's not going to be an opportunity that you're going to, oh my goodness, when I die and I see God, I'm going to tell Him something. No, no, that opportunity is not going to be available to you. You will be silent before a holy God. Third point, Jesus died on our behalf. He was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare His generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. There's a reason why the history of the world pivots on the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how much this sin-rent world has tried to deny the Lord Jesus Christ, even by changing the very dating reference. I mean, mate, history still remains measured by the years before him and after him. They've even, I mean, this is part of the points that they actually go through. They even change the dating reference in order to hide Christ. Can you believe that? And the first place that I discovered that was in a Bible college of all things. The BC and AD was removed and now we have this BCE and CE, you know, before the so-called common era, which is not common, and then we have the common era, which I just... Maybe look at it more like before the Christian era and, you know, the Christian era. But maybe that's wrong. Before the Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the year of our Lord, 2023. And the reference should remain as a perpetual reminder that Jesus died for our transgressions. Isaiah 53, 4 to 5 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. He was bruised, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. We are healed. 
This is the incredible news that Philip would have explained to the great man of Ethiopia. This is that news that it's through his death that we have life. This is that incredible news. Look what it says. He has borne our griefs. He has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. No wonder history can't help but remember him. No, no wonder every time a diary is opened, we remember him. No wonder every time we sign a contract and that's signed and we've got the date, it re- we're reminded of Christ. No matter every time a transaction is recorded, every time a login detail is registered, every time the sun comes up, every time a child is born, and every time a man dies, we subliminally remember Christ. This event, this event, this incredible event. The date is affixed and the date is a perpetual reminder that Jesus died on our behalf. God will never suffer us to forget what Jesus has done, why he came, why he died, why he rose again. The logical conclusion, therefore, Paul made clear in 2 Corinthians 5.14, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. If one died for all, then we're all dead. Indeed, all were dead in trespasses and sins. Last point this morning is our faith claims his testimony. Our faith claims his testimony. In Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37 it says this and as they went on their way they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said see here is water what doth hinder me to be baptized and verse 37 is the answer to the question and Philip said if thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Verse 37 is the testimony that gave the great man eternal life. Verse 37 is the testimony that is deleted in modern versions of the Bible, if not in the text, in the footnotes. And yet it is the very text that actually testifies to Christ. It's incredible, isn't it? The atheist desires to deny the existence of God and to feel as if they can escape the judgment of God, right? The historians deny the value of Christ by by replacing the references that hinge on his life, BC and AD, changed to BCE and CE. And yet the recalcitrant Bible scholars also want to deny the testimony that lays claim to eternal life by removing the confession of Christ. Isn't it interesting, eh? You'd almost think it was a conspiracy, you know? We don't believe in conspiracies in this church, all right? We don't believe in them. We believe only in reality. You know what conspiracy means, don't you? It means with common breath, with common breath. Interesting. They've changed the meaning today. Truth and reality is a stubborn thing. It's a stubborn thing. The Ethiopian eunuch laid claim an eternal life by believing the gospel in his heart. It's incredible. People turn their entire houses upside down to find the winning ticket to lay claim on a fortune in Taslotto. They turn their houses upside down in order to find that ticket. They knew they had the numbers. It's the same numbers that they use every single week when they go and they pay their taxes. Uh, taxes, yeah, taxes. You know, you know what Taslotto is. It's a tax on those who can't do math. That's all. This gentleman by the name of James Howells, he was an IT engineer. And he was in his late 20s when he threw out his old computer hard drive in 2013. In 2021, he offered the equivalent of $100 million to the local tip to recover his hard drive. What they did not know was that James Howells was the only, was only the fifth node on the entire Bitcoin network at the beginning. He left his laptop running for a week mining Bitcoin but it made a lot of noise and so his partner had asked him to just turn it off. But in that time he mined over seven and a half thousand Bitcoin in one week on his laptop. At its peak that seven and a half thousand Bitcoins was worth over half a billion dollars. 
You can understand why he wanted to offer us a hundred million dollars to recover the hard drive because he inadvertently threw it out. What doth hinder me to be baptized? If thou believest with all thine heart, this is what is needed to lay claim on eternal life. That's a lot of ticket owner needed the ticket to lay claim on the fortune. And James Howes needed his computer hard drive to lay claim on an incredible fortune. And all we need to lay claim on eternal life, which is a fortune that this world doesn't have the money to repay, is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ with all our heart. It's all we need. It's all we need. Oh, goodness, beloved. If you would only know that it's all we need. It's all we need. We don't need to jump through hoops. The God that so loved the world that gave His only begotten Son didn't require of us any dowry. He doesn't require us to pay the debt that Jesus died for. Jesus paid the debt that we could never pay. He doesn't require of us to go through our own personal hell in order to be somehow purged from our own sin. This Christ did for us on the cross. His death is sufficient for all our sins. That's it. That's all that's needed. That's all that's required. And you have eternal life only, only. And the only way you can claim it, the only way you can claim it is if you believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's an, it's an incredible thing, you know. It's, it's, Acts chapter 16, there was an event that actually happened. Have a look, Acts chapter 16. Look at this for us for a moment. When the earth, earthquake shook the prison in Acts chapter 16, um, just before that, there was Paul and there was Silas and there were some other apostles there or some other disciples of the Lord there and they were singing hymns to the Lord and then an earthquake hit and it shook the prison and it, and it opened up the bars, opened up the doors and loosed the bands that they were bound by and naturally at this particular point a frightened prison guard came uh, and he was concerned about this because he knows that if he loses one single prisoner his life is forfeit and here the entire prison was opened up And there was many prisoners within there, so he drew his sword and he was ready to kill himself. And Paul cries out and he says, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And in verse 29, it says, Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This isn't, this isn't a religious system. This isn't a system where you've got to sit there and you've got to go to church every single week and you've got to do this and you've got to do that. We gather not because we have to, we gather because we want to. We want to, we want to gather. And if you don't want to gather, there's something seriously wrong. Something seriously wrong in your walk. How could you not want to gather with people who have the faith, the, your faith and have a hope of eternal life like you do? It's all you want to talk about. It's all I want to talk about, you know, until I eat. <laughs> this is the reality, you know, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we have eternal life. If there was another answer to that question... And that is the question of questions. The question isn't, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do when I grow up? The question is, how can I have eternal life? What must I do to be saved? That is the question. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus, recorded in the Gospel of John, is saying this. In John 3.16, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever does what? Believes in Him. Believes in Him. He doubles down in verse 18. He says, He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. 
If Jesus knew of another way to enter into eternal life, surely this is the place that he would have written it. But no, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. That's it. Oh, but I believe, pastor, I believe. Well, yeah, the devils also believe and tremble. How do you believe? I've always been growing up in a Christian home. I've always heard about Jesus. But are you born again? Are you saved? In that same text in John 3, he's speaking, Jesus, to Nicodemus, the Pharisee. He says, unless you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. How must you be born again? Believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. I sort of wonder at this particular point, there's only one key. There's only one key that locks fortune forever. That unlocks eternity and that is our faith. That's it. That's it. Are you, are you you're willing to scour the whole house for that ticket? Are you willing to dig through the debris of your own heart to order to find that faith that would find eternal life? Are you willing to do that? Now that man, James Howes, is still still digging. Well, not not physically at this point, but he's still trying to find a way that he can unearth literally millions of tons of debris in order to find that hard drive. He's still trying to find a way. I read about it recently. It's incredible when you think about it. Man will dedicate their entire life to try and plough the earth for a fortune and yet all we have to do is believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and we have it. It's an incredible consideration. There are those who are lost, who are not yet saved, whose imminent death is going to usher in an eternal nightmare. There are those who claim to be Christians but have not yet produced the faith that brings eternal life, having believed in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. They are in a far worse situation because they don't know that they're lost, yet they are lost. They may be as one of the many in Matthew chapter 7 who will confess, Lord, I know you, you know, haven't I done this in your name and that in thy name? And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. There are many, the Bible says, that will be that way. Finally, there are those who have believed the gospel in their hearts and have a true claim on eternal life. People who have changed their stars forever, forever. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Today, there is no reason why every person in this building should not believe in their heart and lay claim on eternal life. There's none, no reason for any of you to hold on to your current life and not be willing to change your stars. Every single one of you can have eternal life. Why? Because the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I pray those who of you who know Jesus then preach to others, Jesus. Preach to others, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, and ask of you, dear Father, that you would be with us, that you would bless this time, that in every way we may glorify your name. And if there be any here, dear Lord, who are not yet to know you, I pray, dear Father, you would touch their hearts. And if not today, then this evening. And if not this evening, then tomorrow. But perpetually, dear Lord, that there might be a splinter within their side, that they will not stop until they rest in Christ, that they will not rest until they have that eternal rest in you. And I pray, dear Father, for those who are born again and saved and especially for those who are being baptised. Bless them, dear Father, and glorify your name in their lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.